Japanese horror. Like everything in Japan, they have their own unique, weird little take on all of the tropes and things we have in our own culture, and horror is no different. They have their own wonderful little world of Japanese horror films, dating back all the way to the pre-filmic years of the Japanese kaiden, or kaiden, these ghost stories that they would tell, and they have a large, elaborate mythology of evil creatures, monsters, and vicious evil what's-its that have been terrorizing them for a very long time, and naturally, they started putting them on film. Now, this collection is not specifically about J-horror, which started in the late 90s to early 2000s, although it does encompass that. It's going to include a wide variety of Japanese horror films, with no particular linkage between them, except for the fact that I really like and enjoy them. And so, without further ado, let's start looking at some of my favorite Japanese horror films. Jigoku. This movie is a masterpiece. It's not just one of the best Japanese horror movies I've ever seen, it's one of the best horror movies, period. It was made in the early 1960s, and it feels impossible that someone could have made a movie like this at the time in any country. It is about a young man, a theology student in college, who is seems to have the perfect life. His studies are going well, he's... Uh, has a beautiful fiance. He's going to be marrying into a nice, moneyed family. Everything seems good, except for the fact that he has this bizarre doppelganger, his close friend, who is sort of uh, uh, his fetch. He's evil, unpleasant, weird. He constantly brings up a, a dismal, tenebrous, pessimistic outlook on things. He claims to be sleeping with his fiance. He actually strikes and kills a man right in front of our hero uh, while they're driving in a car together and then does nothing. He doesn't report it to the police, which causes tremendous guilt. And it, which causes tremendous guilt in our hero, but it causes our, uh, this doppelganger character type person, this best friend, to feel absolutely nothing. He's like this mirror image, just sort of totally at odds with everything moral and right in society, and is totally not evil exactly, maybe more amoral. He doesn't feel anything, he's more of an animal. And the first th two-thirds of the movie, we go through a series of events uh, where we see the dark, ugly side of society, where the man that was struck and killed by the doppelganger guy was actually a local Yakuza, and this person's mother seeks out to get revenge on the two that ran over him in the car. Guilt begins to eat away at our young protagonist, and he doesn't know what to do and thinks about going to the police, but he doesn't know if it's right or not. He begins to question everything in his life. And it's a very eerie, dark, very psychological horror movie throughout that first two-thirds. Eventually, however, at the end of that two-thirds of the movie, virtually the entire main cast dies, and they all immediately get sent to Jigoku, which is a Japanese term for hell, one of their the East Asian sort of concepts of the underworld. And we actually get this drastic, radical change in tone, and the film suddenly becomes this evil, vile film showing the pit of hell, and all of our main characters as damned souls being tortured, murdered, covered in flames, stabbed, attacked by monsters. The huge lord of hell is there torturing damned souls. It's extraordinary and an amazing visual feast. It's one of the most incredible moments I've ever seen in any horror movie, and the fact that it radically changes right in the middle there is so incredible. It works on that eerie building up of tension horror movie, but it also works in a very visceral, oh my god, this is a nightmarish, grotesque, violent thing kind of way. It works on multiple levels. It's an intellectual movie, but also a visceral movie. And you can think about it and see it in a number of ways. I think it actually, in some ways, influenced the movie Enemy by Denis Villeneuve, who directed Blade Runner 2049. Or if he hasn't actually seen it, it was sort of a prefiguring of what, what went on in that movie about a man seeing this horrible double of himself. In fact, Dostoevsky wrote a short novel called The Double, in which a lot of these ideas of the doppelganger, uh, this sort of evil form of yourself, were explored. It's just such an extraordinary movie. You really have to see it to see this incredible slow burn at the beginning of a gradual tumbling down into the misty abyss of darkness. And then we also get to see this terrifying vision of hell at the end of it. It's an extraordinary movie. Highly recommend. Beautiful looking, incredible acting. The, 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 the style of the film, 
Both the early darkness and the later fiery hell is incredible. Highly recommended that you see this movie. It's one of the best horror movies ever made. Criterion Collection released this on DVD. It's great. Go out and see it. Suicide Club, also known as Suicide Circle. This movie is incredible. It's one of the best horror movies I've ever seen. It was made in the early 2000s by Sion Sono. I don't quite know how to pronounce that. And he's an extraordinary Japanese director, and the rest of his filmography is worth checking out, too. But this might be his best film. It is about a wave of suicides in Japan in which large numbers of people are killing themselves seemingly for no identifiable reason. And the movie actually begins with a horrifying scene of dozens of Japanese schoolgirls jumping in front of a train all at once. And the movie actually acknowledges sort of the silliness of what we're seeing and it looks a mixture of horror, ridiculous, absurdist humor. Uh, you know, when we see these girls leap to their death, it just looks so ridiculous. The police start a special task force to start investigating the suicides to see if someone is causing them, if there's some sort of evil cult or criminal group that are trying to make people in some way or compel them to do this. And as they begin to investigate this, they find a bunch of weird things surrounding the suicides, most notably a website which tracks the number of people who kill themselves and whether they're male or female before the suicides happen and they exactly write down the number. It doesn't really make any sense why that's happening and they tr the police are looking further and further into this while we're watching more and more scenes of people killing themselves and it's all pretty disturbing and unpleasant to find out what's going on. The main detective in the story is played by the main character in Audition, another movie on this list. And he's actually very likable and he tries to figure out what's going on as we try to, you know, understand the puzzle of suicide because in some ways the movie acknowledges the same puzzle that everyone has about self-murder. Why does it happen? The questions that we're left with, especially if there's no note of why someone would do that, it's completely left to us even by the end of the movie, which is pretty amazing. This movie is not just good, it's great. It's a great film because it leaves all of these amazing unanswered questions by the end of the story. You know, we still really don't know why anything was happening at the end. We get this weird sequence toward the end where a bunch of children have been calling up the police officers, leaving vague statements about the deaths, claiming somehow to be involved. And at the end of it, we actually see this large collection in this weird, almost disused hospital or school where a bunch of children are hanging around and they seem to be somehow related to the suicides, but they seem to be kind of friendly and nice. And we don't really know what they're doing. Are they evil when they're trying to make these people kill themselves? Or are they good because they're trying to answer a fundamental question about life itself? Why do we live? Why do we do anything in this world? Why do we suffer all through all these things uh, day to day? Why don't we just die? You know, it, it's almost like taking the, the question from Hamlet about why suffering the slings and arrows about rageous fortune. And it, adds, it asks these questions about modern society, especially about modern Japanese society, which of course has an extremely high suicide rate, one that is far higher than most other countries that are in the first world, higher than some that are even the, in the third world. There's so, you know, it seems like an ingrained part of Japanese culture to suffer in silence, which may cause a lot of these people to end their own lives, unfortunately. And as we investigate these suicides and why they're committed and what this weird, I guess it's a cult, they don't really even explain it exactly, these children running around, which is a truly creepy and unpleasant sequence because there's this executioner there to tear off someone's skin because they weirdly leave at the scene of some of these mass suicides a giant roll like a wheel made out of strips of skin of all the people that killed themselves sewn together. So it wasn't, it doesn't seem like it could be a random act of suicide committed by an individual, but a mass act of self-death for some reason or another that's really difficult to say. I mean, no one knows why any of this is really done. The police try to investigate it. But in some ways similar to other movies on this list, the movie radically changes in the last third or so of it, where we're suddenly no longer interested in the police investigation and are more shown this weird cult-like group of people that are trying to... Uh, we don't really know. Make people kill themselves? They, they want to make people feel like, why are they alive? Why are you doing this? Have you lost your connection to your fellow man? Or do people kill themselves because they lose that connection? 
Or is the connection to their fellow man evil because it's obviously symbolized by this connection of skin sewn together with various people? Why is that there? Why does that exist? It's so creepy and dark. Is the connection we have to other people not allowing us to express ourselves with individuality and that's why they're taking their own lives? It's very difficult to say. The movie is a masterpiece that explores some of the richest and most serious issues in the entire world. And in some ways, there's even like a political angle to it with Japanese society and why we're doing anything, why we're here on this earth, why we suffer through the world. Are we, you know, they ask at the end of the movie, what is your connection to you? In Japan, you may have a connection to the state and society and other people, but you need a connection to yourself in order to continue going. And they're trying to get people to do that. And if you can find that connection to yourself, maybe then you can go on living. Otherwise, you're probably just going to better off dead. So it's an extraordinary film, a scary film, a funny film, a weird film, a film that just leaves you with, que like any great art, it leaves you with questions at the end with no clear answer that just excites your mind to start thinking about new things. It's a magnificent work, highly recommended. See it immediately. Vampire Hunter D. Made in the mid-1980s, this is one of the earliest Japanese animated films I'd ever seen. And it's incredible. I really, really like it. I, I enjoy that old-fashioned 80s to early 90s era of Japanese animation. I think it advanced just enough past the truly old-fashioned stuff from the 50s, 60s, and 70s to be to look a little bit more modern, but hadn't quite reached the mid-2000s level where things began to change, really, about the style. I, I think it looks incredible. The story is about D, who, who is essentially Alucard from Symphony of the Night, and almost certainly heavily influenced Alucard in Symphony of the Night, a vampire hunter in the far future, where the world is somehow controlled and owned by vampires. So it's sort of like a weird mixture of science fiction, because there's science fiction elements in here, but also because we're living, I think, also in a post-apocalyptic Earth. Like maybe the, the Third World War happened, but then afterwards vampires took over. Sort of a little bit like wizards, where the elves and dwarves and mutants took over after the Third World War. But whatever is happening, vampires are in charge now. Werewolves, mutants, demons, monsters, all kinds of things roam the land. And there are groups of hunters that go around attacking and killing things. Humans live, in the words of the anime Bastard, a Bastille-like environment hiding away in their tiny villages, uh, afraid of all of the terrible demons just lurking outside. And we follow D as he gets in, who is the son, by the way, of Dracula himself, and thus one of the most powerful Dampeels on Earth, or Dampir, the Japanese L and R is a little weird. And a Dampeel is a half-vampire who has some of the powers of vampires, but also some of their weaknesses. So he can use that to become a very effective vampire hunter. And he joins up with a young woman who's a werewolf hunter who gets bitten by by a vampire named Magnus Lee, and he's hired by her to defeat Magnus Lee, one of the most powerful vampires in existence. The movie is a visual treat. The town, the, the weird gothic town they live in looks incredible. The monsters are amazing. The character design, especially around the faces, may be a little bit primitive by modern anime standards, but it doesn't really bother me because I'm a little older and I don't care about that. The monsters look extraordinary. Dee's castle seems to heavily, I think, have influenced Castlevania, various Castlevania games in many ways. It was released, I think, in 1985, and it was actually based on a manga that was out before that. It's an absolutely incredible action-adventure journey. I really, really enjoy this. It's simple, straightforward, action, gothic horror fun. And it may seem a little silly to some people, but I, I really just love this movie. It's, it's just a fun, silly, no-brainer actioner. I like the character of D because there's kind of a sadness to his character where he's not really capable of enjoying anything in the human world, so he just ends up being this lonely figure, sort of uh, wandering the world, sort of like Kane from Kung Fu, wandering the earth, solving problems. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. I, I really, really enjoyed this movie. It got a sequel in the early 2000s, and this Vampire Hunter D is extraordinary looking. It is absolutely 
gorgeous, one of the best Japanese animations I've ever seen. The costumes the characters wear look incredible, the castles they're in are amazing, and in this one, D is once again hired to help protect a young woman who's being attacked by a vampire, but interestingly, unlike in the original movie, in this one, the young woman actually seems to want the attentions of the evil vampire that's trying to drain her blood, because she wants to be turned into a vampire and become his lover forever. And so there's a very, there's sort of a different dynamic there. D is also uh, working uh, not along with, but sort of in rivalry with another set of vampire hunters who are really, really cool looking. These, these vampire hunters, one of them is a giant guy with a huge hammer. Another one has these weird psychic slash magical powers that he uses. And of course, there's a young woman who D sort of kind of falls for in a way. And, uh, you know, this just looks absolutely stunning. There are giant post-apocalyptic segments where we see the ruins of the previous world. There's an area called the Barbaroi where these weird mutant creatures live in the woods and practice these evil magics. And you know, we get to see the giant vampire's castle. And there's also weird science fiction elements mixed in here, like spaceships, and the vampires want to go to another planet. Very anime kind of mix of ridiculous things here. But this one, unlike the first one, which was just good looking, this one is stunning and absolutely gorgeous and is going to be completely fine for more modern anime fans. Uh, the story is a little bit more complicated, but more this is a visual and action oriented experience. Vampire Hunter D had a huge influence on one of my favorite series, Castlevania. It's an incredible aspect of gothic horror, and it's a, an amazing use of uh, the animated medium to create a sort of fun, fast-paced, action-oriented horror world with all of these strange monstrosities in them. It looks incredible, highly recommended. It's a lot of fun for Halloween. Audition. This one really lays the whammy on people's head when they first see it. Released during the height of the J-horror craze in the late 90s, early 2000s, this is one that absolutely broke through so many different horror tropes and levels that it just left people feeling sick inside. Who has become known as being a truly grotesque and violent director, and this movie is probably his masterpiece. It's about a middle-aged movie producer whose wife has died, he has a young son, and he feels sort of lonely, and he wants to find a wife, he wants to find a girlfriend. And in order to do that, he sets up a fake casting call, and at this fake casting call, he interviews dozens of women, not for a movie, but specifically in order to find one to start dating. And the woman that he ends up dating here is, well... Let's just say that she rivals Hannibal Lecter in her horrendous behavior towards the human race, or more, maybe more accurately, Buffalo Bill. She had definitely more of a feel of, uh, of that guy from Silence of the Lambs than Lecter. And he eventually interacts with this vicious serial killer woman and learns slowly over time what she is really about. And this movie is brilliant. It is paced beautifully. It used to work in making sort of low-budget VHS straight-to-video kind of action movies in the 90s, and you really wouldn't have thought that he would be this visionary a director, but he does a beautiful job setting up this film. It's a very cool film. Like a lot of the J-horror movies, it's kind of sort of bluish or dark, and, and everything has this sort of shadowy umber over it. And we start out, I think, really liking this, uh, our main character. He's really feel for this guy because he's lonely, he's sad, he's, he's a good guy, you know, there's nothing wrong with him and he just wants a girlfriend, but he finds it difficult interacting with women and going on the dating scene. And he wants a way to sort of game the system so he could learn everything about a young woman. In the cattle call of casting, these girls are going to be selling themselves to him in theory for a role, but one that actually doesn't exist. And he's going to use that in order to find a girl that he really likes. So he's not really the most moral guy in the world. He starts out kind of nice, but then you feel like, eh, he's not doing something that's entire, entirely on the up and up. But the woman that he finds turns out to be a terrible nightmare. She is a violent, abusive, crazy, psychotic, and a serial killer. 
And in a way, it's hard to tell exactly where this movie is coming from. And strangely enough, in the modern era with the Me Too movement, this movie actually seems to have grown in importance somehow. It's a movie about something that was made 15 years before it even existed, you know, about the women in Hollywood especially, but other industries, but Hollywood in particular, who are subjected to this world of being sort of lied to and used for the gratification of powerful men in the industry. And it's sort of a horrifying thought that these men might have that, oh no, what if I do this? And it turns out that the woman that I'm with is horrendously violent and evil. You know, so is it from the man's perspective that it's showing this? That, or is it more about the woman and how they're put into this terrible, desperate situation? It's really hard to say, and it's been argued that the movie does not really side with the man or the woman. It's not about that. It's really about these two individual characters. As I said, this guy isn't a sleazy Harvey Weinstein type guy. He's a normal, regular person that you feel for in the early parts, and you know, you, he has a good relationship with his son. And it's hard to see him as a bad person, but he goes into this moral gray area. And the woman that he's with, who seems like she should be seen as a victim in all of this, actually turns out to be a hideous monstrosity. The sequences with this young woman in her home are some of the most terrifying I've ever seen. They are as terrifying, if, if, not, if not more so, than the scenes with Buffalo Bill in the silence of the lamb. She is so off her rocker, and the things that she does to her fellow human beings are so torturous and nightmarish, they'll leave you with scars for years afterwards. The movie actually takes a sort of weird approach at one point. Halfway through the movie, it suddenly changes tack and becomes much less realistic and rationalistic and follows sort of a dreamlike pattern, so you don't really know exactly what's going on and you see things from the past and people's memories and it's very very odd and can be a little bit confusing but overall this movie is amazing it's terrifying to watch brilliantly filmed the acting is absolutely extraordinary the characters have depth and sophistication to them and there's even nowadays a political angle to this that can be analyzed so this is a great film one of the best j horror movies ever made highly recommend it see it immediately The Horrors of Malformed Men. Now, this is an absolutely incredible movie that just blew my mind, and it was designed to blow people's minds back in the psychedelic counterculture days of the late 1960s. It's part of a genre of Japanese horror called Ero Guru, or Erotic Grotesque. And in the words of one of the creators of Silent Hill, what creates a sense of horror? And it's a mixture of sex and death, of creation and destruction. So the Iro Giro world brings together these two issues, sex and death, that even decades later during the Silent Hill games, people were recognizing, at least the masters of Japanese horror were still recognizing, were at the heart of horror, of seeing something sexual about creativity, the procreation of life, the continuance of oneself in an animal rather than a spiritual sense, mixed with destruction, the terror of dying before being able to do that. It sort of plays at these atavistic fears at the heart of everyone's soul that maybe there is no real soul and life is just a sexually transmitted disease and that's really all we are, just flesh and destruction, sex and death. And this movie is a masterpiece of the erotic gr grotesque. It is about a young man in an insane asylum who supposedly is completely sane and inappropriately locked up there, but it creates this seed in the audience, sort of like in Caligari, where we don't really know whether we can trust anything that's going on or whether that's just a bizarre figment in someone's mind. Again, a little bit like the strange mixture of insanity going on, especially in Silent Hill 2. And this man eventually escapes from the mental hospital and very suspiciously says he's framed for killing someone, but again, we don't really know. Is he, is this a reliable story, or is it, did he really kill someone, or falsely accused? We're not sure. And he manages to escape and take on the identity of a double, again, like in Jigoku, a sort of doppelganger for himself. And he assumes this dead doppelganger's identity and goes to the, to the island of this man's father. And what he finds there is a psychedelic, freaked out nightmare. It's sort of like the movie Freaks mixed together with psychedelia from the late 60s and sort of all put together into a great stew that creates a Japanese version of the island of Dr. Moreau. 
which it, this movie seems heavily influenced by. The, the book that this movie was based on by a famed Japanese horror writer was written just a few decades after The Island of Dr. Moreau. And you really get this feeling of this bizarre scientist on this hideous island trying to create the perfect human being by blending together uh, animalistic characteristics with the human form. And right there, there's the perfect erotic grotesque, the beast mixed with the human. You know, we're, we're seeing right in front of us this nightmarish vision. Are we really just animals that can talk? Are we smart animals? Is that all that we are? The world that it creates here is stunning on this weird windswept shores of this rocky island in the middle of nowhere, Japan, where these horrible freaks are living with their twisted makeup. It looks incredible. It's not exactly frightening. It's more like a fever dream of the bizarre and the strange. It really feels more like Grand Guignol. Our main character has a little bit of a Jeffrey Beaumont from Blue Velvet kind of feel and that he's a normal person that's drawn into this very abnormal and bizarre world and we get to see his reaction to it. Uh, we get to see all kinds of fantastic and hideous, absurd images, like a woman being chained up in a cave and these weird beasts dancing around. And there's also a humor element to it. This movie actually is intentionally supposed to be, I feel, sort of silly and kind of funny. It takes a joking attitude towards everything, and the, the freaks on display are more like Japanese performance artists that are dancing around, sort of like the crippled fools at a court in the medieval past. They're weird, creepy, unpleasant and all sort of uh, kind of humorous, but it's, it, it's humorous in a very grim, unpleasant kind of way. The movie is an absolute stunner. It, it was actually not shown in Japan for a very long time, and it, was, it wasn't even put on VHS, and it was only released on DVD pretty recently. This, this is a complete, crazy, psychedelic trip of a movie. It's great. It'll blow you away. Watch it now. Marabito. This is a great one and one of my favorite J-horror movies from the late 90s to the early 2000s during this era where Japanese horror kind of exploded. It feels very much of its era and uses that era's style beautifully. The story is about a man named Matsuoka who we know from the start has very odd mental health issues and he Matsuoka seems to be undergoing some kind of severe depression to the point where he is in some sort of fugue state and barely able to interact with the real world. He wanders around Tokyo. He works as a uh, cameraman for a television agency, but he wanders around with a camera all the time. And he only works sporadically, so he's very often just has little to do. And he wanders around trying to film weird things around him in the world. After becoming terrified at the sight of someone killing himself, he decides to descend into this murky, mysterious labyrinth beneath Tokyo, this giant, the subterranean intestines that form the quite literally visceral part of running any modern city where the electricity and the plumbing is, and he ends up wandering around there. And these opening scenes of him wandering around in the dark are some of the scariest I've ever seen in a movie. And they're truly spine-tingling. I mean, they're really frightening. As he's wandering around in this weird place, he discovers a bizarre underground world, sort of like in Journey to the Center of the Earth, and he finds underneath this weird labyrinth of tunnels the sun and a place that looks like it's outside, even though it's underground. And he finds a beautiful naked young girl there that looks sort of faintly alien in a way. She doesn't look like she's a human being. And he drags her back somehow to his home and begins to interact with her. Marabito is the weird name in Japanese for some sort of strange special creature, and that's how he's sort of treating this person. The rest of the movie, we begin to try to dismantle exactly what is going on, and we begin to learn that everything is not as it seems. Is Matsuoka just insane, and he's fantasizing about all this, or did he actually interact with some sort of weird, mystical creature? The story is heavily based on something that was known as the Shaver Mystery. And it was created by a man named Richard Shaver back in the late 1940s, who almost certainly had some sort of mental disorder. He had some kind of schizophrenia, he was locked in mental institutions, 
and yet he invented this elaborate, almost science fiction world of these evil underground creatures that live beneath the surface of the earth and come out at night to torment and torture people. They were really just figments of his imagination where he thought that the people that were incarcerating him in mental asylums were these evil, torturous monsters, and he created this elaborate world around them, but he passed it off as a real event somehow, and some people actually believed him. And Matsuoka really feels like a shaver-type character who's clearly insane in imagining something uh, based on the real-life insanity that's going on in his own life with his wife and his daughter. Is this strange creature really just his child that he's torturing? There's sort of like a Jacob's Ladder-ish sort of feel where they kind of present a number of different concepts of what could be happening until the very last moment when they explain, I think, fairly definitively what's going on. This story, in some ways, actually reminds me a little bit of a horrible movie, one of the worst movies of the 2000s, made by M. Night Shyamalan, called Lady in the Water, where a man finds this bizarre girl who sort of looks and feels in the same sort of way like a fairy or a pixie or something. Even their legs sort of look similarly pale and sort of translucent almost. It feels very similar, except that movie was horrible and Marabito was a masterpiece. Sort of in a way, honestly, like uh, Suicide Club was very similar in a way, in a sort of way, to The Happening, except The Happening was one of the worst movies ever made. Well, one of the worst horror movies ever made, one of the best comedies ever made, unintentionally. And yet Suicide Club takes kind of the same idea, but does it brilliantly. And I would like to know if Shyamalan actually just straight up ripped off those two movies in a way and made horrible, awful Americanized versions of great Japanese horror films. I don't want people to get the wrong impression and think that these movies are bad because they kind of sound like those Shyamalanian films. But anyway... This movie looks beautiful. It was shot digitally rather than with real film, and it has a very kind of early 2000s handheld quality to it, but I think that actually works. It's why I really don't like that style, but in this case, I think it's one of the rare instances where it actually works. Marabito is very frightening. It'll get your brain going, trying to figure out what's happening. Everything is sort of spooky and weird. Mental illness plays a role. It has a Silent Hill-ish kind of feel here and there as you descend into these subterranean pipe-like areas, which reminded me a little bit of the sewer area of Silent Hill 3. All of it is just beautiful. I think it works incredibly. It's scary, it's bizarre, there's not a clear answer to it, which I like. I don't want it to just be given a straight-up answer to what's going on. It was actually made by the same person that made the Grudge films. Unfortunately, I think those movies, both the Japanese and American ones, were terrible. And yet this one, which was made sort of in between shooting the Japanese version of the Grudge and the American version, I think... Uh, is actually so much better than any of them. They're, they're, it's an incredible film, highly recommended. See this as soon as you can. So that was just an overview of some of the best Japanese horror films that I've seen. Obviously not a definitive list by any means, just some of the, the great ones that really stick out in my mind. So please tell me in the comments below if you've seen any of these movies and what you thought of them, if any of them sounded good based on my description. And what other Japanese films you have seen that I didn't mention that you think I should check out, because I love Japanese horror and I would really, really like some recommendations about what I should see. So please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I'm going to leave a link at the end of this to some of my other videos that I've made about film and other Halloween-related things, so please check those out. And let me know if you'd like to see more of these types of videos. I can do another video about some of my favorite Japanese horror movies. And I was also thinking about doing a video about some of my favorite horror-related anime series. So please tell me in the comments if you would like to see that. My name is Mike Snow. Thank you very much, and have a good night.